my name is Debbie O'Brien. I'm a senior program manager at Microsoft advocating for Playwright. And uh, if you haven't seen any Playwright sessions, I've got another one in this room later today. So make sure you come and check that out. And I'm here with the one and only. Scott Hanson. Hi, <laughs> I'm Scott. Um, I'm uh, an old programmer uh, and I've been uh, running all over the place at Build, uh, doing everything I could to meet people, talk to people and do fun stuff. Pretty much running all over the place. Like literally, I've seen him. And this is. Hello, I'm Justin. I'm a senior cloud advocate here. Cool. So what Justin is going to do is he's going to be running around with that microphone. If any of you have questions, and I would love you to get in, as involved as possible. So don't be shy. Feel free to put your hand up. Interrupt us at any moment. And as well in the chat at home, if you're watching from home and you have any questions, Justin will check out the chat and he will interrupt us as well with those questions. So yeah, let's get started. Just say no. That's it. We can go home now. Yeah. <laughs> Scott, did you say no today? I, did I say no? I don't want to say no because when a new opportunity comes down, it's like a Tetris piece and you look at your cat, your outlook calendar and then another <laughs> outlook and you're like, and rotate it this way and turn that one. Then I could say yes. Cause then you become, yeah, I'm, I'm a people pleaser, but I'm also saying yes to stuff because I'm afraid if I say no, then they'll never call me again. Yeah. And Especially I have, conferences. Like, and I have FOMO. Yeah. You know what FOMO is? Fear of missing out. Yeah. Yeah. It's awful. So I have that. So imposter syndrome plus people pleasing plus FOMO is not a good thing. Yeah, it's not. So you just say yes to everything. I'm learning. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sleeping in can also be a way of passively saying no because then you just don't show up. <laughs> and like, I guess he said no, he was really asleep. I thought that was what you were gonna do today. Just roll in late. No, just not show up. Yeah, just say no, that'd say be... no to your own session. <laughs> that'd be great. No, I was happy that you invited me, thank you. Well, I'm glad you're here. So um, I have some topics. I'm going to run through some slides and I'm going to start by just sharing a little story of how this talk came about. And I didn't tell you this, so you haven't oh. seen this either. I didn't. We didn't even run through this together. He has no idea what I'm going to present. But um, yeah, a couple of years ago, this was me in a hospital bed. Now look at the smile on my face. Burnout led me to there and I was super happy in that hospital bed. I didn't want to go home. Now that's bad, right? If you're in a hospital and you don't want to go home, I was like on holiday, having the best holiday of my time in this hospital bed. And uh, I asked my husband for the computer and he was like, no way. So I said, can I have the iPad? And he's like, to watch Netflix. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and as you can see, I'm watching Microsoft Ignite. <laughs> and then I'm tweeting about the fact that I'm watching Microsoft Ignite. <laughs> and this is not good. So this is what you should not be doing from a hospital bed. But um, that were the times of COVID when um, they moved all the conferences to October. You remember that time? So you had all the October conferences and all the May, June, July ones. And they said, yeah, but you don't have to travel. So you can do four conferences in the one day. And Debbie's like, OK, yes, yes, I can. And then that led me to there. Have you ever had any of those kind of experiences, Scott? I haven't had burnout, but I have had what I called timed freakouts in the Walmart parking lot. <laughs> and and what that is, is when you go to Walmart, uh, which is like a big you know shop. Shopping right? supermarket, no? It's like a supermarket, but, but less. And uh, then you go to get something, but then you can't get out of your car, and then you start crying uncontrollably. Uh, and then you kind of look around because you want to make sure that no one else at Walmart, like, are you crying because you just left Walmart? Are you crying because you're at Walmart? Like, there's all kind of <laughs> Walmart-related questions you could potentially be crying about. Uh, and then my mom said, feel bad, but put a time limit on it. So then I set a timer for like 10 minutes, cry, like, and then stop, exhale, and go, okay, what's going on here? And I try to be intentional and present in the moment. And like, why is my body rejecting the situation is it in that, that it's in? Is it lack of sleep? Is it food? Is it blood sugar? Because I'm diabetic. Is it, uh, you know, family stuff? Is it work stuff? You know, what is it? And then how do I make it stop? Yeah, that's hard. Is that burnout? I think kind of is. Yeah. Kind of, it's getting on that lines. <laughs> just, you just, you stayed in the car and didn't go to the hospital. <laughs> okay, so a couple of things. Let's try and fix this issue, right? Let's try and fix this problem. So a couple of things that I did. Now, just before we kind of like show you slides and stuff, I do want to say, we are just normal people and we are not mental health 
specialists. We're not trained. This is just our opinion and our ideas. So if you do like are suffering from problems, like we're happy to help, but we can't like professionally help you. So do reach out for help. But uh, by all means, you can chat to us, uh, of course. So yeah, this is one thing that's really important is prioritizing self-care. Now I have this sign in my house. I bought it and I look at it all the time. Do more of what makes you happy. So sometimes, you know, my boss might ask me to do something and I'm thinking, does that make me happy? Is that something I want to spend all my time doing? And then it's like, maybe I could try and do something different and not focus on that. Or am I doing something in sport and I don't want to do that sport? Is it making me happy? Um, what do you do to prioritize self-care? I I'm raising two young men and I need them to understand though that there are things that are not going to make you happy. So mm. you have to make a list of the things that you have to do. And what I usually do is I have the same list twice, copy pasted, and I sort them differently. What is impactful, meaning what needs to be done to move a thing forward, where impact is, you know, work impact or something like that. And then what is going to make me happy, which is a different kind of impact. And then I try to see what are things that are towards the top on both that like, oh, well, this thing is impactful and would make me happy. And then if something is hugely impactful, but it's totally going to suck, then I have to figure out where I'm going to get that from, where I'm going to get that energy from. And I try to set that up. And for me, this is kind of silly, but I, I colorize all of the calendar items the way that the calendar item makes me feel. So like mm -hmm. red meetings are going to suck and like green meetings are going to be energy in like what's I, my meeting when we have a one to one yours is pink. OK, it's kind of red, though. No, it's kind of red because I. <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of red. It's red because it's getting towards like manager work stuff because mm. it's not like ah, I'm going to just hang out with my homie because I have we, to, we could just hang but out. I have to do your review, your annual review and mm. stuff. So that is work stuff. Right. You're so right. That's pink. Sorry. For me, you're like in a nicer color. Oh, but that, the, in doing that, I can look then, and this is important. I can kind of blur my eyes and go and say, wow, what a red week yeah. or what a green week or whatever. This is really good advice. And I took this from you and you taught me this and I've done the same. So anything I need to prepare stuff for is in red. So my brain needs to do some work. I need to turn up for that meeting and my brain needs to be clear. But if it's like a Scott meeting, I don't have to prepare anything for him because I'm just having a chat. So he's green. So he's like, you know. That's nice. Yeah. But I think what we're doing, though, what we're promoting, what we're selling here is uh, deliberate practice, intentionality. I also really like to have meetings with myself. How do you do that? You set a meeting, like a one-on-one, -on -one, and then you just don't invite anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and then that means that they can't get in that meeting. Do you remember that no one's coming? No, I just go and I'm okay. like, like I have Monday planning like 9 a.m. on Monday. So 9 to 10 on Monday is like vision. This is actually a thing that uh, J.D. Meyer has a website called gettingresults.com. Uh, it's called Monday Vision Friday Reflection. So I reserve 9 to 10 on Monday and 4 to 5 on Friday. And the, the Monday 9 to 10 is a meeting with myself to go and say, what the hell am I doing this week? What's going to suck? What's not going to suck? How am I, when, when do I go to Chipotle? Do I get double meat? What's going to feed my spirit this week and how do I survive this week? And then the four o'clock meeting on Friday is truly a forgiveness meeting where I forgive myself for all the crap that I did during the week. Or what you didn't do. Or what I didn't do. And I go, like, I'm going to feel bad for an hour. And then I reset and I do it all over again on Monday. It's very cathartic. Interesting. I don't know if people think that's the stupidest thing. I don't know. Heard. What do you think? I don't know. That's where we have, <laughs> that's where we have our friend here. You digging that? 80%? Okay, you like that? Good. B plus? Yeah. I mean, that's a way of being intentional and present in the moment. And this is important because I've, I've talked to you about this, that I've been in tech now for, this is year 31, but people can use that as a cudgel. You can't tell me anything, Debbie. I've been in tech for 31 years. Seven of it, I was kind of sleepwalking. So I really don't have 31 years because a lot of those years were just the same year multiple times. I wasn't there. I was just kind of like at work. Just you know doing I mean? your job and then you know, going oh. home. You know, and I don't mean it in that kind of like cocaine fuel. That, oh, the 90s, man, I don't remember the 90s. <laughs> you know, I just mean more like, you know, like 2018, like COVID. Like, you know how everyone was all like hustle culture and COVID. Like, oh, if you didn't learn Chinese during the pandemic, you weren't working hard enough. If you, did, if you didn't start a crypto company with AI and, you know, dude, if you survived, like you're killing it. Like, good job, right? So like, but I don't really count that year as a year of experience from like a work perspective. So then I reset. 
go, hey, am I meeting my goals? And then I say, what am I trying to accomplish this week, this month, this quarter, this year? And I try to wake up multiple times a week. If you, you don't drive, right? I do. I just, I just run everywhere because it's okay. You know, so cheaper. you know when you're driving, though, maybe you don't have this because your, your island is very small. Uh, <laughs> she lives on a very small island. Um, when you're driving and then you, you kind of like wake up, you're like, oh, crap, I'm driving. Right. And you like went four blocks. You ever do that? Am I the only one? I mean, we don't know. That's terrible. You're looking at me like I'm insane. Everyone's like, I totally drive sleeping. I don't mean sleeping. I just mean not intentionally present in the driving. You just kind of like, oh, and then and then what will happen is you'll go like that. And then you'll tell yourself, I'm never going to do that again. And then you do it again. And then you do it again the next day. Right. It's that. But for your career. How many times can you intentionally wake up and go, what am I doing here at Little Debbie Snack Cakes? I'm a diabetic. I shouldn't have got taken this job. No disrespect to Little Debbie Snack Cakes workers. But you know what I mean? Like, I, I, this isn't where I want to do, what I want to be, what I want to whatever. And then you try to wake up and do something about it. Sorry to talk so much. No, that's so, so, totally cool. Very cool. Yeah, you can clap. You can clap. Snap. I love that. Some, like, jazz... Uh, Club snaps there in the front. That's good. And we got claps on on the Teams chat as well. Thank you at home. Um, let's talk. A, oh, we have. Oh, we've question. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. And just a quick question because you mentioned that every single Friday you keep for, for uh, forgiving yourself for the things that you did or you didn't do. What about the things that you cannot forgive yourself for? How do you manage that? And that was a question on the chat too. I mean, what do you do when you can't forgive well, yourself? Awful question. Yeah. <laughs> What do you do about the things you can't forgive yourself for? Why can I, you not I've forgive? I've never done anything. I mean, there's there's people that once, don't though. Did they kill somebody? <laughs> I did, what do I they did do that cannot be forgiven? Okay, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have been very Maybe blessed they should that go I, to church. I haven't had anything like that happen. So I don't think I'm the best person. I'm sure that there are things, you know, like I did, I did accidentally run over a small animal once in the car, but <laughs> I... I can, I mean, I feel awful about it. I still remember that. And I'm sure that there's a parallel universe that like forked where I didn't do that. But I, I'm able to forgive that. I do recognize that there are things one could do. But I think it comes down to intentionality. If you intend to do something, then you probably need to talk to somebody. But if you did something unintentionally, you have to forgive yourself or you won't. It'll be challenging to continue. And people can change. So maybe you were a different person back then and you have changed and therefore. That is so true. I went to, I made the horrible mistake of going to my uh, 30th college and uh, high school, what's it? Reunion? Yeah. If I wanted to hang up with them, we'd still be hanging out. <laughs> you didn't say no. And I realized that, like, I'm not that guy. And they were like, thought I was that guy. Like, that was 30 years ago. I'm not that guy. But they don't want to meet that guy. They want to see the one they remember. Yeah. So I'm on, like, Scott version seven right now. You know, so I'm way better than Scott version three. That guy sucked. You know? So yeah, that, that, that's another thing. We are, oh, it, we need to be giving ourselves grace and permission to improve. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah. Thanks. Good. Cool. Thanks, Scott. Well, hard question, brother. Yeah. Right. Good, good stuff. Thank so you. I have a slide up here called setting boundaries. Um, this is kind of, you know, really important because uh, we work on different time zones. A completely like nine hour difference we have. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's really hard to kind of like, you know, switch off from kind of different people. Like I might send you a message and for you, it's like three o'clock in the morning. And do you answer that message? And how do you set those boundaries of like, I mean, you're, you're green on teams quite a lot. I see you're green. I see you, Scott. That was a very kind of like, <laughs> Jacques Hughes. Yeah, yeah. That was pretty aggressive. I see you green on teams. I'm going to chat you right now. I'll tell you what I do. And then, and then you can think about your answer. <laughs> so um, what I do is I, I actually do like seriously set out my time on Teams and I have to cover American hours, right? So I changed my, my whole time zone to be able to have a layover with America. So I live in Spain and um, I'll work till nine o'clock at night. So there's like from six to nine, we can have a really three hours where I can have Teams meetings and I can meet people. Now it's really exciting at nine o'clock at night because, you know, the playwright team are doing this really cool stuff and I'm like, I really want to be part of this, but I shouldn't because I need to finish at nine. Because if I don't finish at nine, it'll be two o'clock in the morning and I'll still be on that playwright call doing cool stuff. So I find setting boundaries and really saying at nine o'clock, no, I'm finished. I'm not doing any more. I can't. I have finished end of story and I turn off all my applications. Okay, but let me push back on that. 
what if I was a jerk and kept bugging you and getting into your space? And that would become a toxic relationship where I'm asking you to do stuff like I call you on seven uh, on like you know, seven a.m. on a Sunday morning, and you're like, I feel stressed. If I'm gonna oh, maybe I'll lose my job. My boss is a jerk. So I will go back. You actually have a slide for that. Slide. Oh my God. <laughs> I think though that that is that wouldn't you agree that comes from a place of privilege? It is really hard sometimes, yeah. And, and um, you know, you feel like I should answer. It's my boss. I need to answer him. He's going to sack me if I say no. And I think you you also the thing is if I say yes and keep answering him, he's going to think that I work till ten o'clock at night. And he's going to keep messaging me at nine thirty at night. And now I'm not going to have like any free time with my husband, and and I'm going to get divorced. And it's not going to be nice. Well, so that really escalated quickly. <laughs> Like I DM'd, I DM'd my boss and now I'm getting a divorce. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, it's, it's you have to set your boundaries and then hope that your boss is okay with you saying I finish at nine o'clock at night. Right. So recognizing that when I say it comes from a place of privilege, I mean that there are people who have toxic bosses and all that kind of stuff. But one thing that's worth remembering is, A, you teach your boss what you'll put up with. If you are the one who answers the 2 a.m. email, then you have just taught them that that's cool and they will do it again. Mm -hmm. And then also it's on the, the manager, in my opinion, to ask you how you like to be managed. And I learned that really recently, even though I've been managing for a long time, I realized that I would show up and ask you for like status updates and stuff, which is what I want. But I never really asked you like, what do you want? How do you want to be managed? You know, and I have some people who want two or three one on ones a week. And I have other people who are like, call me if I'm dead, you know, like <laughs> they, they, the, the level of what they want. And that's all by asking each individual person, how do you like to be managed? Do you like paperwork? Do you like just send bulleted lists of here's what I did? Do you like one note? Do you like one drive? And that's a way of being accommodating. Yeah, totally. Oh, we have some questions. You want to go and run? And Yay. We have like three. Whoa. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. And thank you for putting on this topic. I think it's very, very important. So um, as a, a manager, um, sometimes you have um, folks on your team that want to um, level up. They want to get higher positions in their careers. And a lot of times you have to fight for them as a manager because of the impression that they set with other people mm -hmm. because of things like saying no, setting boundaries and having their their own space. How do you handle scenarios like that? That is a really great freaking question. Um, I think about that in the context of how I used to think about mentorship, which is like a weekly lecture with an old person, uh, and the difference of how that has value, but sponsorship is bringing people into new spaces and creating luck out of nothing. Because luck is opportunity plus being prepared. And if you have a person on your team who is prepared and they're ready for the next level, how do you create luck for them? How do you make put them into a space? Do you mention their name more? Do you have them present the work rather than you present the work? Do you How do you set them up and then step back and have them do it? However, if they are maybe not effectively doing that with other teams, then you have to have uncomfortable conversations with people about what it means to work in a giant corporate capitalist society, which means managing perception. Yeah, exactly. Right? I came here to bring my whole self. Well, your whole self kind of sucks and you're mean and people don't like hanging out with you. So let's talk about that. Like you've got to be like real. It's like, well, I should be able to just, you know, do PRs and, and well, yeah, but here's the thing, like culturally, for example, and, this, and I'll be interested in what you think about this. West Coast Americans like being friendly with people at work. And the East Coast Americans have a different vibe. And some countries like to be friends with people at work. And other people are like, I am not your friend. I came here to work. That's OK. And in an inclusive environment, we should be able to do all of those things. But the reality is sometimes you got to play the game. Tell me about your hike this week, Debbie. I care deeply about your week. Really? Thanks. It was so amazing. <laughs> right? Like those little like life hacks about managing perception matter. The problem is a lot of young people, early career people, don't realize that, wow, there's a lot more squishy human stuff at work than I thought there would be. I thought you wanted me to just grind out that code. So I try to coach them, sponsor them, and present, present them. I'm not sure that's a helpful answer, but it's one of those recognition of the uncomfortable position we're in, where the goal is truly to bring your whole self, but the acknowledgement that if you can bring 85% of yourself or 92% of yourself, that you're probably killing it. You should keep doing that. But you do got to have put up with people you don't want to put up with. I hope that were not pointing there. I, saw I, wasn't, you. I wasn't pointing at Debbie directly. <laughs> that was a wonderful question. Thank you for that.
We had another one, I thought? Yep. Oh, who we got? Oh, this gentleman here. So hard to see. No. <laughs> cool. Uh, no, yeah, thanks again for opening the space to talk about these things that a lot of like typically organizations sort of pushed back or say, hey, oh, no Zoom meetings Fridays or team meetings Fridays. So that's that covers mental health. So I appreciate you guys uh, expanding more and giving some more nuance to it. Uh, my question was about like other boundaries besides time based boundaries, because I found that like having personal device boundaries or even digital boundaries can help like my mental switch from, you know, work and non work activities. Um, can you share some other non time based boundaries that you've found? Or yeah. Like my phone is off during the day. Like if my family want to get hold of me, like they really need to like really make a big deal and call me a couple of times because I'm not going to, because if I start reading WhatsApp, especially like, you know, at that time when I'm in like full meeting mode, they have just finished their day. They've had their dinner and they're in full chatting mode. They want to like call me, chat. And so WhatsApp is going crazy, right? So I turn my phone off. It's always in silent. Now my watch is on, right? So I can glance and go, yeah, it's just my ma. Yeah, just ma. Yeah, I can deal with her later, right? But, or, oh, this is a really important message that came through. I will deal with that. So that's how I do things. And also on the computer, I have no notifications turned on ever. So I do have one screen that I dedicate to Teams. And I have that open all the time. So I can just glance over and see, Scott sent me a message. Okay, I'll go and answer that now. Or no, I won't answer him now because I'm in the middle of code. And then if I'm recording, I just I just close Teams and you cannot find me for that hour because I'm in recording mode or deep kind of code mode or whatever. But you need to just sometimes turn off your apps. No one's going to die if like one hour you don't, they can't call you. Like, don't worry. So like when you're, I mean, I hope not. <laughs> but yeah, that's what I do. I don't know. What do you do, Scott? For, for me, it comes down to why would someone be upset with you or resent you? Resentment comes from unmet expectations. Unspoken expectations, by definition, breed resentment. So if you came to work at the company, we had a great interview, we had a great onboarding, and then like months in, you're like, man, my boss freaking wants me to be online all the time. No one ever told me that. It would have been nice if that expectation had been presented to you upon coming in when we had these conversations. At any point then, that expectation could have been identified and could have been worked out. And now you resent your boss, you resent your company, everything sucks, right? Sometimes there are times when you have to do stuff you don't want to do. And then the question is, is it happening enough that you can tolerate it? Um, at Microsoft, I got promoted to a title called partner. And my boss, it's like one above principle. And my boss says, partner up. That's his way of saying, that's the job. The expectation is that you're going to have to work this. Like I was up till 2 a.m. yesterday doing that demo that I did this morning. And ironically, 2 a.m. the previous day because I needed the demo to work. And a lot of us did that. And I'm like, if I called my boss and I'm like, you know, it's just really not important. Everything is culminating to this, and I'm standing as the, as the talking head on the work of thousands of people to disrespect them by saying, I really want to go and watch XO Kitty, of which I'm on episode three. It's really, really, very good. Um, <laughs> then that disrespects their hard work. So I partnered up. Now, if I'm being asked to partner up, senior up, principal up, right, seven days a week, that was not in the deal, right? So it's an ebb and a flow. I will be gone next week, right? But if my boss doesn't set that up, then we're going to have a problem. So because the expectations were clear that sometimes I'm going to have to really do a 60-hour week, that's okay because the next one will be a 30-hour week or a 20-hour week. So preventing resentment through unspoken expectations is the way I think you should do that. And that's a two-way street. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. We have one over here and we have one over there. So These questions are lovely. I know. Oh my this God. is amazing. Yeah. So who does it come if you see me looking at my phone, I'm not, Actually, not saying no. Actually, there is a great question am, in the chat um, that says, pancreas. how do you deal with the manager who's doing the micromanagement? Ooh. Yeah, I had so a... I had look a, at me with that immediately. <laughs> immediately. <laughs> how do you set um, the, the boundaries? I will tell you what I did when I had a manager who micromanaged. Not, I left... Not me. No, not you. I, I left the company. Because I couldn't figure out a way to deal with it. Thank you. <laughs> and that's hard, but it took about eight months of me putting up with it until I found a job. It's not just like, I'm going to leave and I'll get a job okay. tomorrow. Yeah. So I had to go, right, I'm going to leave this job, but he doesn't have to know. And I'm going to make sure that when I leave, he's going to like want to have missed me because I'm going to do an amazing job for the next eight months or whatever it takes till I find that next job. 
And then I'm going to say, right, I'm ready. I'm leaving. I've got a job. And he's like, why are you leaving? Sounds like you like that. You like spite quit. Yeah. <laughs> kind of cool, right? <laughs> so you, you had like enough petty to go around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I did try and fix things first, and I did try, but it it did it was hard. I couldn't fix it. Yeah. I know. Uh-huh. Put me on the big stage next good, time. Good job. Let's do it. <laughs> Nobody so, talks about this stuff. So boundaries are, I guess, something that's specifically um, curated by the person who is setting them. As a member of I, leadership, have you found, or would you can would you say that there's something as one too much boundaries and or unrealistic boundaries? Too many, too many, too many boundaries. Like, I guess if I say no all the time to you and say like, I have all these meetings, you can't get hold of me. That's maybe too many boundaries. So you have to, you have to be accommodating. It's like I've changed my work life balance that I work till nine o'clock at night, right? Whereas I could say no, mm. I work till five o'clock. That's my boundary. So he's gonna wake up, and I'm a, I'm finished. So we will never speak to each other. That can't happen. So you have to kind of. Like, you know, be accommodating as well with your boundaries. Being accommodating and finding compromise is important. We have another uh, gentleman who's in India. So he's 12 hours away. You're nine hours away. And for there was a time when for one on ones and get togethers, he would always have to get up really early or stay up really late. And then I'm like, you know, it's been like 12 meetings in a row and it's always on him. So then why don't the other 10 of us get up early one day or stay up late one day and let him have a normal day. That requires a lot of empathy. And that is challenging because it's a two-way street. And empathy is literally putting yourself in that person's shoes. And sometimes it just needs a reminder. I just need to like check my time zone privilege. Like, oh, I've been I've been sleeping in and this poor guy's up at 2 a.m. Let's all get up at 2 a.m. for him and make him do that. Um, how do you teach that though, I think is the another question. Because whether the boundary is too many boundaries or not enough boundaries, some bosses just don't get it. And that I find really challenging. Unfortunately, then my answer is always again empathy, because if a boss is a jerk, then I'm asking myself, well, why? How did they get that way? And how did their boss become a jerk? And like, what's the pressure coming on? So I'm a big believer in managing up. If I called Debbie and told her that I needed something and I was really intense about it, she'd be like, that was not like Scott. Why is he acting like this? You, we know each other enough that you would say, well, I'd be running to the computer straight away. But you'd say, where is this? <laughs> where is this coming from? Like, like, well, I was told by my boss and then she said and she said that I need to do this and you know stuff rolls downhill as they say and then that would allow her to have empathy for like wow this was a really rough t- I had no idea that was a priority but again that is a two way street so your boundaries question is a great one i think it can be solved if both people come to the table looking for a win win i think it can be challenging when there's a power dynamic yeah. that is imbalanced and unfixable so it depends and like no, i, I hope know that me. answers your question I normally work like say 12 to 9 for example that's kind of like the hours I've set but if someone wants to have a meeting with me and they're in Australia or New Zealand I will like work from 7 to 10 in the morning or whatever time suits them because I'm not going to say like oh get up in the morning at three o'clock in the morning I can get up at eight and do a meeting it's totally fine I'll just run later right or I'll just you know so you just kind of sometimes have to take into consideration other people I do want to add another thing about the personal phones thing this whole bring a phone, bring a, bring a device thing is really challenging. And I'll give you some examples. I have my personal iPhone and I have Teams on it. And I'm okay with that. I don't mind. No one's looking at my browsing. But I have turned off notifications. So I see my Teams messages when I go into Teams. Um, but uh, about maybe about a third of the team doesn't have these tools on their system. But we also have a WhatsApp. Now, this is important. The Teams WhatsApp the team WhatsApp is not the, here's where we can really get to you if you refuse to install teams. <laughs> it's literally the place for like gifts and pictures of your backyard. Me showing you and then I'm running and, and, and it's usually making you feel guilty. Me, yeah, like, yeah, I'm doing two a days because that's what we do. And then I'm watching uh, TV. <laughs> and we set a boundary that now in an emergency, I could WhatsApp someone because, but everyone feels comfortable in there on the rare occasion twice a week, twice a week, Brad, twice a, week. twice a year, <laughs> that we have to actually call them. We did have a situation like a site down, the site is down, get, you know, get them on the horn type of a thing. But I, have, I think it is appropriate as a manager for me to respect the fact that a third of the team doesn't want teams on their phone. And that's cool. And that because the expectation is spoken, the boundary may, may, is appropriate. 
And especially at events like this, because we don't get a hangout, so it's kind of yeah. nice. Do you want to go for tacos tonight? Yeah. That's not going to happen to your teams, because you won't. She may have a follow-up question. Are you good? All right, thank you for your question. Good stuff. We've got one here over here. Um, yeah, down the front. Do you have a question as well? Go ahead. I think we've got like one, two, three in a row right here. I'll start start with this. Yeah, he was yeah he was he was first over here and then oh. here and then here. So we're going in like a we have uh, perfect line. Minutes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so I'm a relatively new manager for a development team, and I'm trying to cultivate a culture where uh, people don't really do like 1 a.m. check-ins and take their vacation. Um, some people just like working and do it at night because they're night owls, but it's not a culture that I like to have in my company. Um, also, because I like to uh, lead by example, I want other people to do that as well. So if people are checking in code at 1 a.m., that might look to others and especially junior developers like that's a normal thing. How do you go about that? So uh, do you want to go first? I don't know. This is a really... No, I, I it's, like, it's basically I saying like no in a reverse, I, right? I want to gently push you a little bit because the first thing you said was because they like to do that. Right. So let them do that. And how do you then make sure that it doesn't give a bad impression for the junior developers? You say it. Unspoken expectations breed resentment. By saying it, then it's okay. Hey, we, we have David Fowler, distinguished engineer. You're not going to see him in the office before 10. He will check in code at 2 a.m. But we talk about it because we have core hours. We'd like you to be around 10 to 2 if you're in the same time zone. That's reasonable. So that's not saying you need to work four hours. That means just like, let's all try to be generally available for this chunk of time. But if he sends an email at 2 a.m. or a check at 1 a.m., because we spoke about it, we can go, that's just David, right? But if it goes unspoken, then you are absolutely sending a message to like, oh my God, I didn't realize that Sunday at 1 a.m. was when we check things in. <laughs> and in doing that, you are being accommodating by saying it, and that's being inclusive, because if somebody's a night owl, and that's when they really are kicking butt, let them kick butt at 1 a.m. Just because you don't like it doesn't mean it doesn't work for them. The question is, are they having impact? And if the time doesn't matter and the impact matters, then you as a manager need to just be clear with them about what your expectations are and you'll be cool. Yeah, I do think it's something to dig into because why are you working at 1 a.m., right? Because there could be other things going, going that, on. That's where you have to be gentle because if you think that there's dysfunction and they are working because you think they think you want them to, that's one thing. But if they look you in the eye as a grown-ass adult person and they go, I love working at night, then you let them work at night because that's what Absolutely. you Absolutely. I agree. People. Yeah. Great question. Good Thank stuff. you. But make sure they're all taking holidays. That's important. Oh, yeah. Oh, but by the way, while, while, while she's getting ready to answer, I had a situation where I was um, on vacation and my boss, Scott Hunter, uh, texted me and I texted him back and he said, that only took 30 seconds. You're supposed to be on vacation. I'm shutting off your access. <laughs> <laughs> so like, he was testing me to see and I failed. Okay, so my question is, we can say, just say no, but do you really just say no? Like, I imagine you have something more thought out that you say to people, if it is something that you need to say no to. So I was kind of wondering, like, how do you decide what to say? Like, what is your thought process? For instance, like, if someone asks you to do, like, a project you don't have time for, a meeting you don't have time for, I imagine you're not just saying no, period. Like, what are you saying? How are you deciding how to say it is my question. Yeah, if it, for me, it's like, if it's not a hell yes, it's a no. So when it comes to conferences, at the moment, I'm really, really lucky to be in a position where conferences are asking me to come and speak at it. I cannot go to all these conferences. I can't do it. So I need to say no to them, but I don't want to close a door so that they never ask me again, because maybe next year, nobody asks me and I want to go to that conference. So it's really, really hard, but you kind of have to word it and think like, thank you so much for uh, asking me to, to, to do this. I would absolutely love to, unfortunately, uh, I just don't have the bandwidth uh, at the moment. Unfortunately, I have too much going on. But reach out again next year um, and let's see if we can make it happen. That's kind of like mine for conferences. Uh, for projects, it depends on if it's a project that maybe Scott wants me to do and it's really important to him. Um, as my boss, I kind of have to think, well, maybe I should do it, but I don't want to do it. We could have a discussion and say, I don't think it's important, but I have this one that could be better. And then you can kind of like maybe do something different that, that you're more happier with, that you think, because maybe Scott didn't think of what I've thought about. So talking to people, um, making them see your point of view, but always keeping doors open. I want to give you props for what you, that you said. If I come to you with a project that you feel comfortable to say, I don't think that's important. That's totally reasonable and appropriate, healthy boss-person relationship. 
I uh, took a tip from Donna Sarkar, who gets asked to do a bunch of different stuff. And she actually wrote down her canned, like, these are the way to say no to different things. Now, she doesn't, like, copy paste, like, here's my paragraph about why no. But in writing down all the different no's, it helped you understand the why you were saying no. I don't have enough emotional spoons. Or I don't want to go to your country. Or I don't want to support your project or whatever. Those are all like questions where you don't want to actually say that out loud. But I have about, uh, I have a, a sticky note on um, the Windows sticky notes app with about five of them where I want to say, I'm so flattered that you asked me to speak at your conference, or I really love to work on your website, but you know, I'm not able to do that right now. I hope that you'll keep me in mind for future things. Like I write that stuff out so that I can use it as a template. I don't just say no, like, thanks so much for thinking of me. I'd love to, you know, I wish I could come on your podcast, but right now, and then maybe I'll have whatever's going on in my life. My kids are graduating or whatever, whatever. Um, I don't give them too much information. It is valid for you to simply say, this doesn't align with my interests or your budget doesn't support my needs and those kind of things. So I'd need to more understand more what your, what the opportunities that you're saying no to are, but you should still reserve the right to not let total strangers on the internet reach out who don't love you and make you feel bad about a decision. Boundaries are saying no. So I don't feel fully like I need to give them an explanation because the no is mine. And I don't know you. So if you emailed me after and you had a question, I might say, wow, what a gift and write a blog post and then send you a link. I could ignore it or I could say no. And that is up to me to do that because I don't know you. That's a great question. It's yeah. Just kick and ask all the questions. There's one over here as well. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you for doing this session. Uh, really appreciate it. So um, I feel like the biggest crit critic uh, I work with is myself. And it becomes, especially with, I've been in the industry for 10 years. I've been coding different kinds of apps, but I still feel imposter syndrome. And you were talking about FOMO and like trying to learn about new thing. There was um, blockchain one day, there is VR one day, there is AI, there is always something new coming up. And you're f like, there is sense of like, you're missing out something, uh, information that is valuable. And if I don't invest time in it, I feel bad the next week or a month that I did not learn it or did not invest time for it. How do you manage that expectation with yourself and be compassionate and say no to yourself? It's very hard. Um, imposter syndrome, we, I think most of us suffer from it and, and big style. And I don't think you ever get rid of it. It just gets a little bit easier. And I, I like to always think a little bit of Taekwondo. Both me and Scott are uh, black belts in Taekwondo. <laughs> Thanks. I'm more of a slap fighter. <laughs> <laughs> and when it comes to Taekwondo for the martial arts sport, Scott, you'll know that you know, you start off as a white belt and you start learning and then you kind of look up them black belts and you kind of think, right, I'm going to get to that stage. You get to that black belt stage and all of a sudden you are like at the bottom of the pile again because now you got the second degree, the third degree, the fourth degree. I'm on fourth degree. I'm first. You're on first. So now, you, you know, he's got to get to that level. There's so much to learn to get up to my level. And then you've got like the master level and it's nonstop learning and it's nonstop practice. And you will never, ever reach the top unless you're like 80 years of age and you've been doing Taekwondo for like, what, 50 years. And then you're, you know, a master, right? right? It's super easy to kick uh, an 80 year old's butt. <laughs> kind of isn't those care. masters <laughs> you just push them over so when it comes to code there's always something to learn there's always there's always another mountain to climb yep. and you're never going to climb them all so you just have to prioritize and say which one do i want to climb what do i want to learn and also it's really really important to not compare yourself to others if i was to compare myself to scott oh my god imposter syndrome like totally or vice versa thanks <laughs> <laughs> so and sometimes we think that as well we think like I put Scott up there like right up there wow up there and he doesn't put himself up there um, so you sometimes you got to look at somebody and just say he's a normal person as well that has just done all these cool things but you don't know the stuff that he doesn't know yeah I, I feel like the only person you should be comparing yourself to is you yesterday every day is a day to turn it around the day sucks that's good because you get another one and that do-over is important. If you are feeling like you are expected to know everything, you have to understand that the internet and very specifically social media is literally designed to make you feel bad about yourself. 
I want to make sure you're clear. There are teams of product managers and programmers who are making the doom scrolling infinite app such that it will never stop. You will never be in first class on a private jet. And everyone that you went to high school with all has private jets. <laughs> right? The algorithm is designed to make you feel bad. So the way that you don't feel bad is you don't look at those things. Right? So then you have to prioritize what matters to you. And if it is not helping you meet your goal, stop it. Now, there are tiny little things that you can do to stop it. Um, someone was telling me that there are like 17,000 unread emails was stressing them out. There's two ways to solve that, right? Like declare email bankruptcy and learn how to manage your email. <laughs> but, but seriously, they're like, well, I don't really want to do that. Then I said, well, then turn off the little badge. And then the red numbers won't be staring at you. And they're like, oh, I never knew I could turn the badge off. You could also just delete the, the app, right? Like those are small things. And I don't mean like that's going to push the problem away. I'm just literally like, why does your phone exist to tell you that you suck? Right? Like I have my parents for that. And uh, <laughs> right? so make those changes. Like my mom's like, why do I keep getting these like un unsolicited emails and stuff? I said, you can click unsubscribe. So I would encourage you to click unsubscribe to the thing. You're not going to ever be an expert at Kubernetes or Python or Playwright all at the same time. You got to pick a couple of them. So do that and give yourself the grace and look around here. Everybody here feels imposter syndrome about a thing. Not everyone here is an expert in Playwright or Kubernetes or whatever. And that's totally okay. Is it not okay, people? Yeah. What's Kubernetes? Exactly. <laughs> oh, and then, and then, so I'm in a panel earlier and apparently there's a tool in Kubernetes that I call Cube Cuddle. I happen to be standing next to the guy who invented Kubernetes. I was like, no, it's not pronounced that way. Okay, well, <laughs> right. I guess I didn't get that interview. Right? You just, you, you have to let it go. It's okay. And I tell my husband like to tell me every morning that I'm amazing. I need someone to tell me I'm that kind of person. <laughs> so you start off really, really That's good. That's a really good idea. Yeah, tell, every morning he's like, Debbie, you're amazing. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And then he kept forgetting. And I'm oh like, tell God. me, come you on. Just, and he kept forgetting. You just told your husband that and he would do it? So yeah, but then he kept. Now. Cool. So oh, I will get. Only one question. Two minutes. One yeah. question. Oh my God. So Stress what what I did was I programmed Alexa, and now every morning I say, "Good morning, Alexa," and she says, "Debbie, you are amazing," and I go, "Yes." That's so crazy. My wife just says, "You're still here." <laughs> uh, so I feel like saying yes to projects has opened up so many opportunities, uh, and I'm so bad at saying no, especially when the projects look really interesting and fun, and I feel like they'll be able to open up more opportunities, but I always tend to overwork myself and work more up, uh, hours than my management tells me to. And so I'm just wondering, how do I get over that kind of desire to, or I guess it's the FOMO of missed opportunities. Are you happy? Yes. <laughs> then do that. Then it's good. Okay. If, if working hard on a thing for a time feeds your spirit, do it. What we don't want you to do is to work too hard and not know why, and then feel bad and not know why you feel bad. I'm busting my ass at build, and I'm having a blast. But when I'm going to break, I'm going to break. I'm going to delete Outlook. I'm going to delete Teams. So like, that's OK. It's not manic. It's busting your ass and taking a break. But if you are just have a background malaise and ennui about everything sucks and it doesn't seem like you do, then talk to somebody. But it sounds like, are you enjoying yourself? Is it working? Yeah, yeah. Are you having but, fun? <laughs> yeah. You like back, your back doesn't hurt? You like got a good chair? <laughs> Rock on, Perfect. do your thing, man. Yeah. It's like when it's like when you want to learn something new and you really want to take two hours a day to really study this, but you're intentional and it's coming back to that. Intentionality. Isn't it? If you're doing it and it works for you, fine. But if you recognize this isn't working, change it. That's our, that's I think what we're selling. Yes, completely. Cool. This is cool. I know. Yay. Right. The time is over. Time is Unfortunately. over. I know. And I had so many slides and we oh, just like, oh my God, oh, like, my look God. at that. Oh my God. <laughs> I want to show you this one slide though, because this is really important. Um, this is what I do on my mobile phone. I put all my Microsoft apps into a folder called Microsoft. And then when I think I want to open up Teams at 10 o'clock at night, I have to click twice. And once I click once, my brain goes, do you really want to do that, Debbie? <laughs> thank you for putting this together. And thank you for recognizing that conference. Things like this need to happen. Thanks, awesome. everyone. Good job. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Justin. Thank you very much. Thank you.